Okay, once again, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to our day one experts event. It's about value-based healthcare. Why is it needed? How is it done? And who will benefit from it? So I hope after two hours of this afternoon, you will get very valid answers to those questions. So my name is Thomas Brenzikofer. I work for Basel Area Business and Innovation, leading the network events for our day one initiative. And I'm happy to be your host and moderator uh, this afternoon. If you would like to spread the news, share your insights, express your critique, or also enthusiasm, please do so uh, by using this hashtag day one Basel. Day one, what is day one? Day one is the healthcare innovation initiative managed by Basel Area Business and Innovation, which is the agency for economic promotion of Northwestern Switzerland, uh, funded by the cantons of Basel Stadt, Basel Land and Jura. Day one is also about these ladies and gentlemen here, our core team, since we founded day one some five years ago or started the initiative. This team has grown and they very much help us to shape the initiative, to lead it and give it the right, uh, the right direction. So thank you very much core team for doing so. And day one is also about our partners, most of all the Canton of Basel Stadt, who gives us a special contribution and then our knowledge partners, all stakeholders, important stakeholders from the region in the ecosystem of healthcare. And then, of course, our supporting partners are Condes, Solardis, Solardis, Fossius and Partners, and Zilke. Thank you very much for supporting us. And of course, day one, it's about you, a growing community of healthcare innovators coming from different disciplines, different stakeholders, different industries and most of all, sharing their insights and knowledge and also working together to shape the future of health. And these are our activities. So at the heart is our network, the day one network. Then we have four or five expert events a year and our big day one conference. Then we orchestrate catalyst projects where we pull together different stakeholders from the industry to uh, analyze workshop on certain topics. And then we have our acceleration program where we help young entrepreneurs to exceed with their ideas to help them formulate their projects and entrepreneurship entre uh, um, businesses. And then of course, we are open to uh, settle new business in our region. So companies, individuals who want to be part of the ecosystem here in the Basel region are most welcome and we help them to settle their business here. And this all is done in our collaborative workspace at the SIP Innovation Park, so Switzerland Innovation Park on the Novartis campus. So the future of health, this is the big topic. What is this about? We see three dimension, how the future of health will evolve over the next five, 10 years. Most importantly, data. We need to create a health data ecosystem. The future of health will be data driven. This will give us new insights into health states within the disease health continuum, which will then allow us to have better intervention, more precise interventions and move from what we now have as called sick care to a more preventive healthcare system, a lifelong healthcare system. So moving from the center, that's healthcare as we know it. We move out to a more passionate and powered healthcare. This is actually the very important message here. We need the patient to engage. We meet the patient at the center of all of our activities and efforts, and then move on to a more human-centric healthcare where we are able to prevent uh, becoming ill in the first place. So this uh, said, we will only uh, succeed 
if we are able to create value, to produce value for the patient and for the citizen. And with this, I would now like to thank, most of all, our partner of this day one expert meeting event, Deloitte Switzerland. And I would like to call to the stage on the screen, Barry Falk, she is Swiss Life Science Consulting Leader of Deloitte in Switzerland. Uh, Barry, are you here? I am here and thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, hello everybody, it's fantastic to see 151 of you have joined us today to really um, have a discussion, maybe a debate, maybe ask a lot of questions, maybe give a point of view about what you really see as the future of health and particularly value-based healthcare and its role. Mm -hmm. So why do we talk about it? I mean, why do we really talk about it? And what's really driving the conversation? Well, first, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that we have rising barriers to reimbursement for innovation around Europe. Countries are searching for balance between rising healthcare and pharmaceutical costs and their budgets are getting smaller and smaller. Certainly COVID and the crisis that has unfolded over the last three months is not making it any easier for the health systems across Europe. The second point is really around the increasing need to demonstrate value for the health system. And not only from the health system and hospital perspective, but really from a multi-stakeholder point of view. Who are all the stakeholders in the ecosystem that are involved in paying for this treatment? And who is consuming this treatment? And ultimately, how are we going to define value and how will we really discuss value? We have an incredible number of new therapies coming to market. Um, many of them that we talk about today that get probably talked about the most in the press have binary health outcomes. Gene therapy, as an example, has almost 2,600 gene therapy clinical trials around the world that have either been completed or ongoing or have been approved worldwide. We also have rare disease, and rare disease probably is the norm rather than the, the, um, what we would have seen even 10 years ago. And, and nobody really knows today what these long-term outcomes are going to look like. So how do you define value-based healthcare in an environment where you don't even know how to measure the outcomes? The next point is really around how do you align what the system is looking to do and what you are looking to do as, as individuals and as companies. And how do you align with the system to share risk, facilitate better outcomes for patients? And, and how do you really share the data that will allow you to measure this? So this is really going to be um, a point that we're going to have to look at and reconcile with is what does sharing risk really mean? And you'll hear, I'm sure, today as you start to think about this and you start to talk and hear from our speakers. And the last point, and this is really just a plus one for what Thomas said earlier, the shift in the healthcare system is moving to a model that emphasizes health and the importance of keeping people healthy versus treating the sick. And if we're really going to move to an environment that's focused on health and keeping people healthy, how then can you, can you define value-based healthcare in an environment that really begins to create a discussion around what is health and how do we evaluate health, how do we pay for health, and how do we afford health? And all of this is really going to pressure and, and push the discussion uh, to what is the future of health really mean for us as, as industries, as healthcare institutions, as system providers, and as um, services companies that, that are involved in the dialogue. So I share that as, as basically a couple teasers for the discussion today. I encourage you all to really get into the topic, ask your questions, you'll have ample time to do that. And I look forward to having the dialogue and seeing where it takes us. And I'll turn it back to you, Thomas, and bring you back on stage. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm really excited now to start. So um, uh, Barry will be back afterwards when uh, at the end of the event. So let's see what we learn uh, this afternoon. Uh, I would like to give some sort of an introduction to the topic now. And as uh, Barry pointed out, basically when we talk about healthcare, mostly if you look at the media, we talk about the cost, right? 
And what we see here is that in Switzerland, we pay 12% of GDP for healthcare. That's what we spend for healthcare. It, it's equivalent of about 80 billion Swiss francs. And this is only moving in one direction so far. This is our experience. It's, it will be coming more and more. So this leads us to the question, how much more can we afford? So are, hitting, are we hitting the roof here? And this, of course, depends on the economic growth and also of the distribution of that income. And so maybe a couple of percentage we can uh, afford more, but somewhere we will be hitting the roof and we will not be able to afford more. So that brings us to the question, what are we willing to pay, right? So just imagine that you will have to or want to sell the Swiss Swiss healthcare system to a country that does not have a healthcare system and you tell them you will have to have the income of Switzerland and then you have to uh, uh, pay 12% of your income for healthcare. How would you sell that? What would the buyer say? So actually the buyer would say, hey, what's that worth? What's in it for me? What's that outcome worth for me, right? So you will be confronted with those questions. That brings us actually to the question, how can we bring the value across? How can we uh, define that value? So actually this has been uh, put forward by Michael E. Porter, the famous business strategist of Harvard Business School, uh, more than a decade ago. So for him, value is outcome divided by costs. That brings the value. So the question is, how do we define a healthcare outcome? So this brings us to the next on top level, it's actually the survival. We want to gain life. We want to have years gained, right? Or we want to uh, increase our quality of life, have a better recovery. So these are the two dimensions. However, these are just factors of what we have to define. And this is a very uncomfortable question, actually. How do we, how much is a human life worth? So philosophers, say this is unethical, we don't tap into this. Business people, they have a measure for that. They say, okay, the value if it's of life is there is a value of a statistical life. So it's not one particular life, it's a statistical life. Overall, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to announce here that over the recent years, this value has, actually has increased. So today, or let's say two years ago, but I think it, this hasn't decreased more, it's 6.5 million francs. That's the value of a statistical life, right? So we now look at the healthcare costs we have in Switzerland. So this is divided per month, per person, right? In average. So we start somewhere at 300 francs a month. And we went, end up, when we reach the biblical age of 95 years, at 9,000 francs a month. So then we can put in what we call the value of a statistical life. And you see, at some point, these two lines, they meet here. So that's when the cost exceeds the value. But actually, this is a, a wrong way to put it, because we also have to weigh in the disability adjusts the life year. So that means if you're an infant, you need care. So that decreases your uh, statistical, uh, your, your value of statistical life. And as you live on, it decreases slowly, slowly, but steady towards the end of life. So what happens here is that actually brings this point a little bit further on. And also the spread between the two lines after that point has reached goes far away from each other, which is somehow discomforting. That's where the costs are. So the only way to a strategy to go against this is actually to create more quality of life, just say, to have a continuous health care, to prevent becoming ill or to maintain a certain health state. And the other thing is, or through doing that, the costs will lower. Uh, and we can push that point where the cost exceeds the value further on. So this is, again, from uh, Mr. Porter. 
It's very interesting to see that we think of healthcare, what we sell as healthcare, we think we sell treatments. And we measure that by volume. So 30 hip, hip replacements, 300 re hip replacements, that's a treatment. But we don't think as healthcare as a product, so we have to go to the point, come to the point where we say the product of healthcare is actually health. And for this, we need a measure. How do we measure that? And this is the tricky point, and this is also the big question here of today. And that's the agenda. So after uh, my introduction, Elizabeth Hampson from Deloitte, uh, sitting in Yuko, will give us the bigger picture of value-based healthcare. Also a little bit tapping into the big question, how did the COVID-19, uh, the experience which was really uh, very decisive in the last months, how will that change this bigger picture towards a value-based healthcare? Then we will have Michael Rebhan from Novartis giving the industry view, namely about how value-based healthcare, which will change the research and development of new therapies. Then we will have Michel Moller from the uh, startup LifeGene here in Basel, uh, and he will uh, give his startup view, having a platform that actually helps managing value-based health uh, contracts. <clears throat> And last but not least, we will have Florian Rutte from the University Hospital of Basel, who will actually talk about, share his experience and insights and how to actually implement health value-based healthcare into the system. <laughs> and then you will, we will spread up the audience in different deep dive sessions. So you can follow one of these speaker and have a 30, uh, 30 minutes, sorry, 30 minutes deep dive session, Q and a, a question and answers and also discussions uh, on one of these views. And my, this will be uh, my colleagues, Thomas Nuremberg, Douglas Hackstrom and Fabian Treif will, will, will join us as moderation and then we will all come back. So now you may be asking yourself how I am gonna go into these rooms. So here I will uh, shortly explain, I will explain it after the speech another time, but if you already have made up your mind. So these are the four rooms, breakout one, Elizabeth Hampson, breakout two, Michael Rayburn, breakout three with Michelle Moller and breakout four with Florian Ruter. And this is how you do it. So if you go on the bar where you, uh, the control bar, you see participants. You click on that. And then you scroll down all the, the participants, find your name, and then hover over. And then you, the button appears, rename. So you click on that. And then you put in front of your name, you put the number that corresponds with the um, breakout session you would like to join. That's how my colleague... Uh, Stefano uh, will then find you on the list and he will then be able to put you in the corresponding breakout session. So this said, our first uh, speech, Elizabeth Thompson, I hope you're there. I am. <laughs> Very good. So may I ask you to deliver your uh, intro or keynote speech? Thank you. I will now stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Just give me a second while I present my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. So I'm really delighted to be talking today. I'm phoning in from London. Um, we're still working from home here. Um, so I'm in my garage. And um, I've been working in the field of value-based healthcare actually for over 10 years. And I've worked with life science companies, I've worked with governments, and I've worked with charities on this topic. And I guess in my, the early part of this period was working very much with governments, thinking about what is value from a, from a payer and a policymaker perspective, and then moving on more to thinking about what's value from a provider and a life sciences and a patient perspective. So hopefully I can bring you a little bit of insight from all of those different views. And I thought Thomas's introduction was, was perfect, really, because when you think about value-based healthcare, you have to think about that holistic perspective. And I'm going to talk about value-based healthcare today and then talk a little bit about what we think it might be. And I think 
As Barry said, you know, there are many driving forces around why value-based healthcare, rising barriers to reimbursement, changing treatment paradigms, a requirement for the systems to be aligned, an increasing need to demonstrate value. But we think of value-based healthcare as healthcare delivered in a model in which the the product and the service providers are paid based on holistic patient and health system outcomes. So it isn't just about the, the patient outcome, but it is also about the system outcome. And in some instances, it's all, also about the societal outcome that is given. And there are lots of requirements for success. It's a very difficult thing to get right. I mean, we've got to have the real world data, um, which Thomas nicely said, everything in the future of health is very data dependent. We've got to have trust and collaboration between different stakeholders in the system. We've got to make sure that within the healthcare system, there's learning. So we know when we're getting it right, we can see the right outcomes and lower costs in some instances, and we can actually build on that. We need patient trust and an understanding of their preferences. We need to be able to shape the care pathway um, to make sure that we get the right outcomes for the patient. So we need to know what the barriers are. And we also need to make you know, investments in, in, in capabilities and infrastructure. And there are a lot of conditions really to get right. And in the work that, that Deloitte and others do, we see the importance of value-based healthcare is really increasing. And there are a range of proven and emerging contract types and the type of contract that really works depends on the type of problem that you're actually solving for. So the early types of what we'd say is value-based healthcare, some people may, may disagree, were actually more financial-based contracts where we're looking at aligning what we thought, where we thought the value position was for the product versus the system with some measure of success around the patient. So for example, capping a particular number of cycles for patients based on an evidence base that that's where the, the the best return is for the patient or and then we move in to thinking about outcomes based contracting where we're paying for cure so we're paying for a patient that no longer has a disease or we're paying for risk-based um, arrangement where the payment is only made when the patient is actually does actually receive the benefit of the product and there might be a reimbursement if the patient doesn't get the benefit so such as we've seen with um, with very new therapy and gene therapy models when they're very very expensive or we can think about a, mul a range of different patient outcomes that are, that are listed and the one that we have on screen here was a rare disease where a registry was actually set up to track things like six minute walk test fev1 which is um, a respiratory test quality of life and, and depression so many aspects of a patient's life were measured and looked at to see where are we getting the value for this particular product? And then latterly, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, we've started to see more service-based contracts as well. And if we think about in a world where we don't have such long trials, maybe because we have a rare patient population or because we don't think it's necessary to prove the safety of the product, we might not be able to be certain about what types of real world outcomes we get for this product. And we might need to actually shape the pathway that the patient is experiencing in order to be able to make sure that the patient is getting the best outcome. So this might mean real understanding of how the service is delivered to get the best outcome come for the patient and different stakeholders getting involved in that. A great example I think is obesity where actually the psychological support around obesity is really important so many providers might come together to provide a different service and so that's where we think as a value-based healthcare it's you know both the financial elements the outcomes elements but also the provider and the service elements and the experience of the patient and all of these different elements combine depending on what is the actual problem that we're getting together um, to solve. And through our work, um, we think that designing the type of value-based healthcare solution goes through three phases, really. One is a really thorough understanding of the problem. Then you need to design something that all stakeholders are engaged in. And then you need to run and check that what you're actually delivering and getting from the, for the patient and the system um, and for all of the stakeholders 
is what you intended. And I think we've put 12 different factors on. I think there are probably many more, but of course you've got to simplify these things. So, you know, we've got to really address a genuine payer, patient or provider problem. So what is the, what is the barrier to getting this innovation to the patient? You know, ensure that we know what we're solving for, that we know what the data barriers are and that we're engaged and in early dialogue and understanding the needs of stakeholders. Then, these con these contracts can be very complex so we've got to within the design balance practicality with co cost and complexity and i think some of the early value-based healthcare contracts really struggled because they were made too complicated we need to think about demonstrating trust um clarifying responsibilities and i know we'll talk a little bit more about implementation later but then when we run, are we actually genuinely getting better outcomes for the patient through this contract? Otherwise, you know, are, are, are we doing it right? You know, test, scale, manage, evolve the contract and consider that what are the unintended consequences? And I think one of the learnings of myself and colleagues is unless you really consider what the unintended consequences are, because you're changing where the pathway or the financial flows happen, you may do something to the system that you didn't intend. And so you need to really think about that and monitor for that while you're going through these, while you're designing these contracts. And then if we think about where success has been to date, success has been really achieved where there's both been a willingness um, on the part of both of all of the stakeholders and, and the payer and the providers to engage in the contract. And also there's been the feasibility to put it in place. And I think this has been more in place for rare diseases historically, but not exclusively. And I think we're starting to see many more contracts come in in, um, in more long term conditions, etc. But they are more complicated to put together. But I think the service based contracts where you're working with behavioral <coughs> plus product, etc. Um, sit more in those space. But the fact is that increase the willingness or the need to engage are really around outcome uncertainty, you know, small, short duration of trials, um, making it uncertain exactly what you're going to get, or you all binary outcomes, as Barry said earlier, mm. high costs, you know, putting um, real strain on healthcare budgets, you know, misalignment of timings, you might have to pay for the product in one financial year, whereas you get the benefit, the patient gets the benefits over a lifetime. So those types of things where there's a real desire to change, to, to engage on, in particularly in high unmet need areas, creates a real willingness to do something. Feasibility to do something is about really understanding and being able to identify the patient population, understanding where the, the care delivery is. <clears throat> so it might be a small number of specialist centers, you know, who's have got oversight or control within the system, you know, it's a discrete care pathway, or there's a small number of healthcare professionals involved. You need engaged patients and physicians, and probably in many instances, a policy focus that's actually supportive of these things as well. So lots of um, conditions for success. And I think in a second, we talk about why I think COVID actually increases more of the conditions for success and the need actually, that both the feasibility and the need, the willingness to engage for value-based healthcare. One of the things that we think is really important is actually looking to see where the success has been. And so we track where different contracts of different types are um, in different markets around the world. And this is an illustration of a, of a screen that we've built. And different countries have different attitudes and different success and in different therapy areas. And for example, um, when we just select outcomes based contracts on this screen, you can see that Italy is by far the top country. And that they've seen a fairly steady increase in outcomes based contracts. Now, they had quite a peak about five years ago and then they started to decline again, um, but then now started to go up. And I think this reflects the complexity of the relationship and the willingness for different systems to engage. I think the systems want to engage. They find it's a little bit difficult. They maybe tail off, but then they realize this is actually definitely the way that you need to think about it in order to get that some of those really important pieces to patients and therefore they they fight they learn and they move forward and I think that's a pattern we see actually across different countries you know pipe pushing in pulling back a little bit pushing in again and along the journey 
Um, to create a value-based healthcare agreement, there are lots and lots of barriers. Um, you need to under determine what's the appropriate measure of value. You know, there can be misalignment in what one stakeholder thinks of value versus another. You know, there's the complexity of com of of um, quantifying, you know, outcomes, benefits or other benefits, proxy measures like A&E attendance is also used. You know, how long do you measure that? How long do you look at the patient population for? There might be misalignment in terms of payers, providers, life sciences organisations around how these, these incentives should be measured. And then there's the operational burden. You know, it's administratively, it's more more difficult to pay for value rather than volume but obviously if you're paying for value you know what you're paying for so I think if the equation is there then the investment needs to be made and sometimes different parts of the state different stakeholders need to get involved to make sure that um, the investment is there there are certain, sometimes there are uncontrollable factors that influence outcomes so it might be the patient behavior or physician factors that influence rather than the product or the pathway itself and then you need to collect the data so lots of different challenges there but wanted to talk about the future so that's the past and there's been lots of successes and lots of failures but I think one of the things that that COVID does is it actually changes the equation somewhat and we all know how much COVID has shaken up you know real world data studies digital transformation etc there's been a real shift in attitudes and and capabilities very very quickly underneath COVID and I think that has a direct implication for value-based healthcare. So for some other work, not value-based healthcare work, but some other work that we've recently done, we've thought about the areas where COVID actually has an implication for the healthcare provider in um, landscape. And I won't talk through all of these, but there are six key themes. One is around prioritization of patients. And there's no question across many markets in Europe that patients, the patient prioritization has changed under COVID. And there's new views of what essential services are. So there's backlogs of patients, some in some instances, really long backlog of patients for cancer. You know, there's been increased triage. There's been workforce challenges, different parts of the workforce coming in, volunteer workforce, but also a massive increase in pressure on the workforce that will play out in different ways around Europe. Technology and innovation, what we've seen is in a very short space of time, we've moved away from face-to-face -face interactions um, to virtual interactions in some instances. And I know in some markets, we've managed to achieve in a few weeks what would have taken years in normal circumstances. And that results may result in permanent shift in some delivery models. Um, this Barry mentioned the funding, you know, there's been possibly in some instances a short term increase in funding, but actually over the longer term, there might be greater scrutiny. Um, and I would I would argue that there might there's probably going to be a greater use of data to define value for the healthcare system. So not only might there be slightly less money, but there will be more requirement um, to provide to actually scrutinize and to provide value to, to show data, sorry, to show what value you're providing to the system. There's been some regulatory um, changes. Regulators have done things at much higher speed than they're, they're used to. And then a, a massive interest of mine, the, the role of mental health. And I think there's been both a rising prevalence of mental health conditions during this period, but also I think over the longer term, we'll see an increasing understanding of the importance of mental health on physical health conditions, which should manifest itself actually in a greater importance of a more holistic humanistic approach to value and thinking about the mental health of, of a patient you might be treating for cancer or diabetes and so if we think about the future of health trends that both Barry and Thomas um, mentioned earlier what we've seen under COVID is um, many accelerators in terms of trends that we were seeing anyway in terms of the future of health so you know new disruptive entrants and partnerships coming into the market changes in the way that pathways and funding flows are happening you know accelerating pace of new technologies emerging and the need to keep pace um, demand for system value rather than stakeholder value um, 
we've seen data analytics and insights. So for example, we've seen much greater use of patient, patient reported outcomes and real world evidence over the last couple of months. And we've seen patients really engage in their own health and their own patient reported outcomes in a way that historically we haven't seen. So we've seen a massive increase in the engagement of consumers interested in their own health because of this. So many of the future of health trends that we were we were predicting have been massively accelerated under COVID scenario. And I think this has some important implications for some of those barriers for value-based healthcare and also thinking about what life science companies um, and providers of healthcare and policymakers can be thinking about in this um, in this environment. And so really when we think about the, the future, I would say that there are four kind of key actions that come out of COVID that relate to value-based healthcare. One is around the requirement to build stronger evidence of value. And this is about, you know, making sure we're getting more data on patient reported outcomes, more real world evidence, stronger value based healthcare propositions. I think the second point is around the fact that a lot of the healthcare systems and providers don't have the capacity that they they had previously. And when they're maintaining um, infection control within their facilities, that may maintain that may remain below the previous level for some time. And so they need to develop new skills and capacity and potentially need partners to support them to be able to deliver, sorry, excuse me a sec, <clears throat> to deliver the services that they might have previously had and they probably need new ways of working. You know, there's the, the change in attitude to digital. So this, shift, this can be really leveraged on the value-based healthcare proposition, thinking about, you know, how do you engage differently um, with your consumer and how do you collect data differently in this new world and then I think the last piece is about trust and I think value-based healthcare really requires trust between all of the participants and I think post-COVID we need to continue to maintain what I would argue is an increased trusting environment because of the actions of many different stakeholders coming in to support their local healthcare systems. And I think the actions of many life sciences and other companies, other stakeholders, have enabled greater trust um, within the healthcare system. And, in the, and as we move forward from this point, that trusted relationship both needs to be built and enabled to, for value-based healthcare to really flourish. So I hope that was interesting and I look forward to speaking to anyone later who wants to either argue with me or against me that COVID accelerates the need and the willingness to engage in um, value-based healthcare. So thank you very much, uh, Liz. That was a very interesting uh, keynote and introduction to our topic. And I would now like to hand over the mic, so to say, to Michael. Michael Reban, are you here? Uh, so please share your uh, screen and deliver your speech. Thank you very much. Michael Reban from Novartis. Hello, can you hear me and see the slides? Does it work? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting reflection on some of the trends in, in that area. And I think like value-based healthcare as a main topic, but there's also a number of other trends like the participation, the attitudes to digital. I think there's a lot about attitudes going on here right now, uh, at least also in conversations with, with different people. And I think this area that I'm going to talk about might also uh, be experiencing a bit of an acceleration in that sense. It's about our realization that we are often intervening too late and that we think that we should be able to intervene earlier, but what exactly does it take? And without value-based healthcare, it's gonna be a difficult journey. So let's see if we can connect those and it's for preparing the discussion in the breakout. I'm a scientist uh, working in Novartis in research. so. The topics I'm interested in are more long-term, like the next generation of products, services, and how we can actually deliver value beyond what we've done in the past and beyond the history in, in pharma that we our classic strengths. And as we're exploring these new paths, 
it's of course like about generating real value because if you don't have a really strong, clear value, basically nowhere, nobody's going to get interested in that. And I think there's a big opportunity to have more focus on the early stages of disease. And while this can be scientifically, technically very interesting, there's a number of tools and ideas there. It's very hard to put them together in the current system. So they, you might need a bit of a boost from value-based healthcare to really accelerate our knowledge there. And you can think like in many areas of life, it's actually we think like, why did we not act earlier? Why did we not see the sickness and then act earlier? It's a very common problem. It's something about how we work as humans. And it can be difficult to really change that. So many people have tried to change it. It's not always a, a success, not easy to make a success out of it. So let's say you can create the value. You can prove that you found a solution, a product, some kind of system, algorithm that creates that value. But will you get enough attention on it? Will you be able to measure the value? Will you get the economic flow into it to keep it growing and uh, globally distributed and so on? These are all things that are not so easy. A big part of it is really the human attention that comes with the value you created. So as human beings, we simply have a tendency to act late when symptoms are strong and really urgent action is required. The medicine is no different. So let's reflect a little bit why why we are struggling with this and how we can accelerate innovation in that area and what the relationships could be to value-based healthcare. And of course, keeping in mind, like, can people actually agree what value means as an important backdrop and how we can re-energize our ability to find a consensus on these value definitions as a basis. Is that forwarding? Yeah. So... Let's go into our brain, how we think. We like to simplify things and we like categories, like binary categories, either this or that. It helps us remember and communicate meaning, good or bad, healthy or sick, which you can see here. This cognitive picture of reality is really underestimating the gray zones that often exist in reality, the gradual nature of accumulating problems. In disease, when you talk about accumulating problems, it's often about organ damage accumulating silently without us noticing. This is what I mean, like the more difficult early stages of disease, which are hard to track from science and medical point of view right now. And these categories, this binary thinking has social consequences. So when you feel healthy, you're expected to contribute, study or work. When you're sick, then you can reach out to others for help. So either you're this or that. You're either patient or not. And uh, many people are challenging this more and more nowadays. So the limitations of the simplified binary view are becoming more obvious, more of a topic, but it's still hard to really, even with the shift in thinking, to really have a change. On the right side here, the, the blue side, you can see where healthcare systems are busy with the really urgent cases. And people also take pride that when there is an urgent case, they can get their act done, they organize, they coordinate, they have good outcomes in many cases. Medicine can do really good wonders sometimes. And we also have good scientific foundations for making decisions there, like based on trials, for example. On the left side, it's quite different. It's about how you feel, what you like, and being part of something. Quality has a different meaning on both sides. And in between, in this gray zone, it's hard to say where this exactly fits in. So current categories have not been designed for that. It's simply a bit undefined uh, exactly how to deal with it. And the problem is that disease is silent and usually goes unnoticed there. So it's hard to also do studies because we always need the strong alarm signals for action. So basically under the calm surface, a problem is growing stronger, gets worse as the disease is progressing until we notice it in a certain stage. So we need a bit of a language for dealing with that at the stick with at the moment there's a bit of a language problem here also. So if we use measures related to quality of life that often comes into the discussion then on those topics, we, we can possibly find a more gradual change that can be measurable, at least can be tracked in some way, for example, with apps and, and different tools. Sometimes we can see not a gradual change, but some jumps in between, of course. 
And, but the question is, in those early stages of disease, do we really feel nothing? Or the sickness are simply too weak to really get our attention? So, for example, if you have for some time low energy, fatigue, is that really due to early disease, just based on the bad weather recently, or you're annoyed by the lockdown? It's a bit hard to tell how this all connects. So you might also find like uh, you have a lot of difficult cognitive tasks in your job that require a lot of concentration and you feel like this is not really going well. But at which point is that really serious? And how much do the standard health checks that are available in your country really catch the important problems? So has anybody mapped the important problems to the health checks? Blood pressure is a very famous one that uh, everybody knows. It's relatively easy to measure. You can get your own tools for that. We can understand it as an early warning signal, but there has to be more than that. Like, so we learn to put our attention on the right things in the early stages before it's too late to act. And I think this will be important also for the sustainability of the systems, making them more robust and knowing how to use analytics to focus on the important problems and build solutions for them. And right now they haven't really been designed for that. So here's a bit of an entry point into, like say data science also being part of the solution. With the steady progress we have in many fields of science and technology, there's new opportunities inside in many areas. But how do we build a science-based systems approach that goes, puts a lot of these things together for really good outcomes and catches problems in really early stages, as early as it makes sense. So pragmatically speaking, we can start with the patterns that we know better, where we have some solid data and they are more on the right side where the symptoms are strong. So let's say we can select an anchor pattern that uh, just puts the different stakeholders, shared value definitions and the data scientists together. And they can develop a shared view of value that is translatable into the patient journeys with very specific patterns you can find there. And then from there, try to work backwards to the first signs of fast progression, find the useful patterns here. And when something bad happened in a patient's journey, what were the first signs and why were they ignored? And where could you catch them earlier? So this, this basically bridging the data science and the stakeholders who might care about pain, cost, efficiency, each one cares about something else and how to put this together is really where the magic is and then see if that anchor pattern, which captures the problem, can be reduced or prevented, what the solutions are, how to measure value, and then if somebody finds a solution, how much is the value actually worth? But of course, it's much easier to build walls than to build new paths, so it's gonna take a while. Here's a bit of AI history for context because many opportunities are also related to AI, but it's just an example for many of the possibilities. So. Uh, since the early expert systems in 1978, there was something called mycin, which was amazingly good for the time. There was a lot of progress since then. Systems we can create today, they can act quite intelligently in many different functions, not in every function. And like when we have really clean data to train them. And how to use these new abilities to catch problems earlier with predictions in a targeted way, focusing on patients with a high risk where you want to put your attention in the system, there will be a lot of new things coming in the next year. This uh, field is really developing. So let's say we can we have an enhanced ability to predict risks and be more targeted, but it doesn't mean that at that moment we really know how to do something with it. So there could be different interventions. We need to learn what fits in which context, which will take some time to really optimize that. And we also need to learn as humans with those increasingly intelligent systems, how we communicate with them in a way that makes sense to us and for the whole system to be efficient. And I think reasoning will play an important part in this. And the current deep learning black boxes are just really a starting point. So there will be a lot of new things coming here. This is an example for a cutting edge algorithm that many of you may not have seen like this because there's like the mainstream media are full of like things that may or may not be useful. It has some, a few intelligent behaviors. It can identify here objects in an image using deep learning. For example, an animal that is there in the scene. 
knowledge is captured in something like a digital memory to help us interpret the objects. And then with some reasoning, uh, the system can answer questions and then try to convince us about the answer it gives. So we really say, okay, that makes sense. So this is a way of communicating with intelligent systems that we are not really used to, which by the way, in the expert system time was also pretty standard actually. Let's zoom in into a particular medical problem, uh, which is in this case, the example of chronic kidney disease or CKD. It's a very common problem. You can see here about 10% or even more in many uh, populations. And the kidneys, what's going on inside, they can accumulate damage for a number of different reasons. And when they do that, it's very silent in early stages, as we just explained. So before we notice that there's a real problem, there's already damage accumulating. And once the kidney is really, the function is lost, it fails, it affects many stakeholders, the families, the patients, the healthcare systems, those who need to pay for dialysis and transplantations, just to name a few. So there's quite a bit of an impact. Quality of life, once you're on dialysis, is not the same anymore. Transplantations can give you much, but it's, it's really not the same. And the scientific, solid, uh, scientific knowledge is much more solid in the later stages. So we know a lot about stage four, stage five, close to the kidney failure, but the earlier you get, the less we know. And this is the problem. It's like almost any disease, it's like that. So it's hard to say in the early stages which patient actually needs the attention is high risk for going to failure soon. And there will be a lot of new tools to deal with that predictions, AI and so on that are gonna help. On this graph, you can see the heavy burden from the disease, how it affects populations in different countries that are shown. It's also using DALI that was just explained. So disease adjusted life years from 1992 close to today. And notice that this DALI captures not only death and mortality, but also if life is really strongly affected by disease. They have a particular definition of disability for that. Similar a little bit to the country comparisons you can do with COVID-19 that now many people have been very uh, interested in. Zooming in even more, here's a patient journey for an individual CKD patient who was not so lucky. So there is a fast decline in the center where the kidney health went from reasonably good to kidney failure and then dialysis. So for a while, this patient was actually quite stable in the green box, but then it went down. So it looks like there was something like a tipping point between the green and yellow box or at the end of the green box but we don't really know much about the science there. This is really hard to speculate what's going on there in the physiology. So you could say this is an anchor pattern. The anchor pattern would be the fast decline, something you can really find at data science level. Stakeholders would care about it. And you can then from there work backwards to the events before, try to predict, see where the patients are in the system and what the outcomes would be that you would actually measure there. And here's a, uh, a particular way how to look at that. So you try to actually find out before the EGFR common measure shows that there is a decline. You're trying to predict what is going on and disentangle the patterns and the information you can get at that stage, which is not simple. And then try to uh, develop very robust predictive model and put them in a context where they can really bring the value and the outcome. So the predictive model alone will not be enough. There has to be a really good system around it to make it work. And let's say if this can be done in community care settings, so really early diagnosis, knowing who is risk, how we would deal with it as a society is a very important question, how value actually comes in there and how much shared value agreement you need to make that work, else this innovation may just not work out, not never reach patients. So I think these kind of problems of early recognition you can find in many areas of medicine, which are similar. And if value-based healthcare develops even further beyond where it is right now, it could boost that area. But the question is, what are the most important developments we would expect and how would they boost exactly what? So happy to then discuss more in the breakout. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I think this is... Uh a lot of uh, information we're happy to discuss afterwards in the breakout. 
looking forward to that one. And I would now like to uh, go to Michelle. Michelle from Life Gene. Maybe uh, you share your screen. Yes, and screen or stage is yours. Thank you. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, my name is Michelle from uh, LifeGen. I want to thank, first of all, uh, Thomas, uh, the past Area Day One team and Deloitte uh, for the opportunity uh, for, for us to present ourselves. Um, it's always uh, great for a startup uh, uh, to present uh, their case. And today, today I want to tell you actually our story. Um, our story is very much a value-based healthcare story and I have currently three chapters. So first of all, I want to inform you a little bit who we are. Secondly, what we have experienced in the last uh, 20 months um, that we've uh, been on this adventure. And third, I want to uh, tell you a little bit what we can do to shape the future more into this value and data-driven uh, world that has been now described already by uh, most of, my, of the other speakers. All the good stories start with the same uh, start, and we're here in, in the Basel area. We went uh, uh, also to promote a little bit Basel. So good things are happening here. Uh, once upon a time in Basel, Nico, Leon, myself, and Irisha from left to right um, have come together and wanted to have an impact on, in the world. We wanted to make it easier and faster that patients can have the, the, the drugs treatments that they deserve and need. And in order to do so, we wanted to use the new upcoming possibilities with novel technologies um, and enable value-based contracting. We all um, have a corporate background. So Dirisha and Nico, they're coming uh, from Roche. In order to be accepted here in Basel, we of course also have the Novartis element with us, which is uh, Leon. And I myself, um, I have a financial background. I'm coming uh, from UBS. Um, our vision is we want to create the most disruptive health tech company by driving value-based healthcare forward. Now, creating a, a new venture is, is a hard thing. We are very, very happy that we have strong partnership and advisors with us that uh, help us, that uh, act as door openers, challenge us, and share their very vast experience with us. Um, I think here in the region most known is probably Jens Grieger, former Global Market Access Head of Roche and currently President-elect at ESPOR. Um, we are also proud members of InnoSwiss and the Innovation Lab of the Canton Spital Baden. I think the role of the provider is very, very essential what we do um, and I'm looking forward to the presentation of Lauren after me. Um, furthermore, we're working together with consultancy companies. Here's a few of them. Um, they help uh, doing the consulting around the project and the implementation. Um, and all this, of course, uh, for our customers, you see here two of them that we allowed uh, to mention. Now, chapter two, um, I think we have already had more than 100 meetings with manufacturers, with payers, uh, with providers, consultants, politicians, Yvonne uh, uh for instance, um, with, with non-profit organizations and so on. And um, I want here to share some of the things um, I, I, I realized in these meetings. And I think some of the, the things have already been mentioned by, by Barry, Thomas, and, and the others here. Um, we have creative, very personalized or, um, drugs coming to the market. Um, they all have sort of uh, limited evidence, but very uh, demanding for a very, very high price. And ultimately, that all brings us to the, the question that's been initially asked here already, what is the value? Second, um, in, in a price negotiation, uh, you can see that the, the, the party that enters this discussion is open and willing to share the risk. Maybe surprising at the first sight is that the payer is rather skeptical because he thinks that that's rather a nicely packed price increase. Um, the, the other big topic that has always been around in our meetings is the data access. access. There, there can be a limitation of data access due to technical limitations, due to uh, data privacy uh, topics, or just rather general concerns by, by one or more of the involved stakeholders. 
Um, then if you can access the data, the other points are the quality and the structure of the data. Sometimes it's difficult to work with it. However, that I think is a very good news. Based on the, the things we already have done, we also have experienced the tremendous power that lays in this data. And I'm very happy that Thomas mentioned this data-driven future that we want to have. And I think we, if, especially also if you align the incentive structure right, um, you can see that the parties are really eager to learn, understand the data better and improve the treatments. And the last point is actually a sad one um, that we should not forget and that uh, lately has uh, been also uh, published by the, by the Swiss TV in, in, in um, I would say, the last three, four uh, um, uh, documentaries that were, were, were showed um, in the last months, um, is that patients have to finance uh, the, the most novel treatments that really might help them um, themselves. So just three weeks ago, a family in, in central Switzerland had to finance with the crowdfunding a $2 million drug um, uh, injection in order to help their child. What, we have, what are we doing? You see here, based on, on the previous speakers that uh, um, have already um, had their speech, the, the topic of value-based healthcare is very, very broad. We dedicate and focus ourselves on really the value-based contracting um, uh, piece. We think this is a, a small piece of it, but it's a very essential one because people respond to incentives and if you align the incentive correctly, um, you can create even more value. Typically, we interact between a manufacturer that might be a pharmaceutical company or a medical device company and a payer. Again, usually uh, health insurance, um, but uh, for instance, in case of medical devices, it also can be the provider itself. And usually if you have, uh, or, or you act in a, in a volume-based setup, um, uh, just by theory, it's very difficult um, that you uh, uh, pay the right price. You either overpay or underpay, but to hit directly the value that you have created is, is quite uh, a coincidence. And in, a, in an ideal value-based contracting setup, you can align the value and the price, and that's actually what we stand for. If you want to do that, then you find those challenges. What we saw in, in our projects that the, the parties are feeling a little bit uncomfortable because there's a lack of experience. There's no international standard. Um, they are open to do those contracts, but they actually do not really know how to do it. There is, uh, in, especially in some markets, there's digital infrastructure, which is not a state of the art, which whereby you just cannot work with. There is a lack of scalability as a consequence as well. Um, we also feel sometimes distrust between the parties. And on top of all that, you see the topics, data security, data privacy, and data access that I have already mentioned. Coming now to the most exciting chapter number three, where I want to tell you what we do and how we can bring that really forward, uh, that we end up really with a value and data-driven world. So this is what is, uh, our platform actually doing. So we connect those stakeholders all together in one platform, uh, completely trustworthy and uh, transparent. Um, our algorithms, they collect, pool, and structure the necessary uh, data. We then have a patent filed outlay algorithm who assures you with, with the highest possible degree, as, as we stand for, uh, that you will really work with the correct data sets. Um, the absolute core function then in the end is that you can analyze the data and that en enables value-based contracting. Of course, then we execute the transaction um, uh, to complete the full process. This reduces the complexity and as a matter of fact, we already have some standards that we want to now bring from one market to the other. Um, and this facilitation of relationship between the stakeholders that really can help to decrease the time um, so patients have a faster access to those uh, therapies they need. And we can do that really on a patient by patient level. I think that's also important to mention uh, um, that, that we can really go down to a patient because we say uh, each individual is different and we want really to capture the value that has been created in each individual. And if you go a step further, I think value and data-driven world, that really comes together. Um, because if you have no data, you cannot do any value-based contract. If you're uh, not adherent, then no one is willing to share the risk. So adherence, access to data, that can all increase uh, with those contracts. 
Um, I think there are more than enough studies that show that the value and the, the outcomes for, for patients do increase with just a, such a contracting. Um, as I mentioned before, and that's maybe my um, experience that excited me the most in, the, in our journey, is we really to see that the stakeholders, they want to learn and improve the treatments, um, and that's good for really everybody. And they lived happily, uh, happily ever after. That's uh, probably a little bit too early. Um, the whole move to a value-based contracting world has really just started. Um, we at LifeChain, we are pioneering this topic and we continue to do so. So the small team of Basel um, is really going out to the world and uh, uh, has an impact here. We want to remain and, and, and grow as a, as a, as a leader uh, in this field um, and, and expand that model forward into other markets. Um, with this, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy if you join me in the breakout room. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Um, <clears throat> we will now uh, move on uh, to Florian Rutter. I think now we have heard uh, what value-based healthcare is good for. Uh, we have learned a little bit how it is done. And now we would like to know how do you implement it? And that's, uh, I think, where Flo Florian comes in because he actually, at the University of Basel, have started to implement value-based healthcare. And he will share his insights on this now. Thank you, Florian. Yes, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me and can see my first slide. First, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present our experience with uh, value-based healthcare, our first steps. And I'm really impressed about the number of participants, about the interest in value-based healthcare on such a nearly nice summer afternoon. Well, at first, that was our beginning, the Swiss equation and our journey from volume to value. At University Hospital Basel, we are convinced that healthcare should be driven by focusing on outcomes that truly matters to patients. And on the left side, in their seminal book, Redefining Healthcare, Michael Porter and Elizabeth Tysberg, for the, for the first time, squeeze this approach into a formula whose poorest approach we follow at the USB. We pursue the approach in the Porterian sense regarding the definition of value-based healthcare. In this value ratio, the numerator, the outcomes that matter to patients on the denominator side is designated to condition-specific results and to such as functional recovery and quality of life, which a denominator, the cost applies to the total spending for the full cycle of care. At least, the description of the whole concept in brief, that you see in the green side down there, it's easy to understand that it is not possible to give a short brief overview about the whole concept in just 10 minutes. And I would like to focus on two points that we consider are essential to start a value-based healthcare project and form the basis for success. It's point number two, the measuring of outcomes and costs for every patient and at least building an integrated information and technology platform. Well, this is the implementation matrix, the so-called the Basel view. And together with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, together with uh, Greg Katz's team from Paris, um, we created an implementation model entitled the Value-Based Healthcare Implementation Matrix which was de designed and which defines five key dimensions which are critical to most value-based healthcare initiatives. First, the recording refers to measuring processes and outcomes through a scorecard and data platform. Second, comparing refers to benchmarking teams through internal and external reports. Rewarding refers to investing resources and creating outcome-based incentives. And number four, improving, refers to organizing improvement cycles through collective learning. And at least partnering refers to aligning internal forces and forging collaborations with 
external partners. Well, why implementing props? At first, I think as a doctor, we have to realize the real treatment value and the quality from a patient's point of view. The classical orthodox medicine deliberately focused on easily measurable parameters such as blood values, joint angles, or blood pressure. But what do we really know about those outcomes which really matters to patients in daily life? Where are patients' preferences and desires? And what to do with the data? We want to make patient-centered treatment at least with decisions based on these outcome data. And we focus on values that are essential for patients. So at least the patient reported outcomes for a reasonable patient-centered medicine on the way to value-based healthcare. And on the basis of the implementation matrix, our first condition, the first example is breast cancer. And from this picture from the iGEM standard set, you see at the above side, there are the classical measured medical parameters everybody knows. But what do we really know about the other things about depression, pain, fatigue, body image, arm breast symptoms, vasomotoric symptoms, neuropathy, atrabia, sexual dysfunction, and the health-related quality of life. And the same in men. This example, classic example of uh, localized prostate cancer. The same, we know a lot about overall survival. We know a lot of cause-specific cause survival metastasis and all these things. But do we really know about things that matters in daily life about urinary incontinence, urinary frequency, bowel irritation, sexual dysfunction and vitality? No, I think we don't know enough. And this is a, almost a classic slide which uh, Christina Ackermann, former ITEM president, left to me. It shows very nicely the decisive difference between the easily measurable quality about the five-year survival and the actually important parameters in daily life. As I showed you before, I think as a man, it's important for me, for my daily life, what about my incontinence after one year? Or what about my sexual dis dysfunction or my erectile dysfunction after one year? And if I, ha if I have to choose the clinic where to, have my, to solve my problems with prostate cancer, I would know where to go. I would go to Martini Clinic because at first they have those data. They are one of the first clinics worldwide to have these data, and they are much better than the other clinics, for example, in Germany. Well, next point, our internal forces. Up to now, after the decision to start with PROMS as the first step to value-based healthcare, which, which was jointly convened by the highest bodies of the University Hospital Basel. Since 2017, we could implement up to now this 11 PROM questionnaires. It was crucial for us to start with a physician leader. And so we started with breast cancer. Walter Weber, who had first contacts to PROMS during his stay abroad at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center in New York, he brought the idea from PROMS to Basel. And there he found our medical director, Professor Christoph Meyer, who had the same idea. And so the idea was born to start with PROMS in breast cancer. Afterwards, he was our icebreaker and the best choice to start with the project. Together with a motivated project team, he created a bottom-up dynamic with other clinics which were interested in PROMS and began to work together. So the breast cancer set was followed by hip and knee osteoarthritis, coronary artery disease and cardiac surgery, and all the others. And we hope that at the end of this year, we will have another two or three more item standard sets under use at University Hospital Basel. Well, the point coming to recording. As mentioned before, we use the disease-specific item standard sets, which consists of PROMS and CROMS. 
CROMs are the patient reported outcome measures and the CROMs are the well-known clinical reported outcome measures. These data together form the scorecard, which is graphically pro processed by an appropriate IT platform on which doctors have all essential information available at a glance. You can see on the upper right side. This is one example from low back pain, where, can you, where you can see with one view at a glance, all important information about the patient. Begin, beginning on the left side with the red dots uh, showing problems, and then in an ideal uh, patient with no more or very slow or low problems after the operation. Well, the patients, they put their data into the system via iPad at University Hospital Basel when they are here in the ambulatory setting or alternatively from home by smartphone or personal computer in compliance with all data protection regulations. And up to now, you can see downwards, we included more than 2,000 patients into the 11 standard sets. Compare. Are there comparable values for patients with breast cancer, atrosis, or after stroke? Yes, there are comparable values between such different diseases in the oncologic area and orthopedic surgery, for example. What about future prospects, pain, or role models in daily life? We are just beginning to find exciting insights. And the second point, what we found in the stroke improvement of door to needle time. After the start of the collection of prompts in the field of stroke, the great attention to quality aspects and the common spirit of optimism enabled us to achieve an improvement. At least on the right side down there, you, we can show international benchmarks. And these are the data of our breast surgeons after reconstruction of the breast, after tumor surgery, which we can compare with uh, very big clinics from all over the world. Rewarding. At this point, I'm proud to present some of our most important persons for the project, my co-workers, Selina Bilger and Annabel Miller. And they are an example that such a project is only possible in a team approach. See on the right side, some more people which are part of the team and we can only have success if we can work together with clinics, with nurses, with doctors and administrative personnel. Value-based healthcare is a team approach and you need a lot of contributors from the known different professions. And you have also, it's very important to inform them about the background of value-based healthcare and you have to develop partnership and that what we have done on the search for an IT platform. We have been developing through partnership for five years with Heartbeat. And I think that's a really good sentence that the next revolution in healthcare isn't a drug, it's data. And that's what we see in the interest in value-based healthcare and in the big interest on PROM data. Improving, what are we doing with our data? We regularly prepare PROM reportings with our clinics to get a common view to the data. For example, this slide from the stroke set regarding from left to the right, you can see the total state of health, quality of life, physical state of health, psychic condition, satisfaction relationships, roles in everyday life, physical activities, anxiety, depression, fatigue and intensity of pain. Very important data for treating the patients, important for the patients for sure, but also important for doctors. And up to now, we didn't really realize the importance of these data. Now we have them and now we can work with them and we can see and now we know what is really important in daily life. Well, for example, in the international setting, we had the European audit for value-based healthcare with Greg Katz as guests in Basel. And with this team, 
And out of this, we found our experience in this actual publication, implementing value-based health care in Europe. This is a recent milestone for us, the European perspective. And in this publication from the European Union, there are only three hospitals. It's um, the Karolinska University Hospital, it's Uppsala Hospital and the University Hospital Basel with all the information I could give you in the first slides. Well, at least the partnering. We have some interesting contacts during uh, our last weeks. And if you want to have success, you have to look for partners, partners to compare your data, to share your experience and start benchmarking. And thanks to the standardized scores, we were able to compare, for example, the satisfaction of our breast cancer patients after reconstructive surgery at the OECD level on the upper left side. And second, since we have unfortunately not yet found enough national partners with PROM data, we are grateful for the international exchange of PROM data and experience with the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv. But interest in value-based healthcare, as we can see this afternoon, is also growing nationally. And we've just started a cooperation with a local life science partner in Basel. Also in pipeline, a cooperation with a life insurance company. Finally, today's meeting with many exciting contacts, stakeholders to whom we extend a hand for the exchange of ideas, experiences and innovations. And I'm personally looking forward to this. So old ways won't open new doors. Thank you for your attention. We start with uh, reporting back uh, um, to the audience what you have experienced. Maybe I start now with Florian, as I see you there. What was your discussion the breakout about? What, 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 was, what was you learning or was there some aspect that you, uh, that you have sensed uh, which you haven't thought enough about before? What, was your, what can you uh, bring back? Well, um, I think the most uh, interesting thing are the real insights on the, the patient side. And the questions we always get is, what did you change uh, with the PROM data? What are you doing with the data? And that was a point we, we didn't really look in the, in the first year when our um, uh, point was to get more patients into more PROM standard sets. And now I think that's the important point. What can we change with the data? and what are the insights we get from the patient answers from the outcome measurements, and what can we do to change things in care pathways and treatment pathways, and at least to combine these uh, patient-reported outcome data with costing data, where we are just in the beginning at University Hospital Basel to get the whole picture and to test if the uh, hypothesis of uh, Michael Porter and Elizabeth Tysberg from the US system is really transferable to the European system. And that will be a very interesting question for the next future. Okay, thank you, Florian. So still a lot of work to do, still a long road ahead, right? But exciting times. So now I would like to ask Liz what have been her findings? Uh, what was the discussion about in her breakout group? Please, Liz, are you here? I am. I am. It was very, very lively. And um, I think we all had some reflections that the current period is going to mean that there's a lot of focus on costs, understandably. And we were very divergent, actually, on what we think that means for the future of value-based healthcare. And I think some of us are more optimists, some of us are more pessimists and the understood like are we gonna are we gonna see a continued investment in data or is data going to be seen as a nice to have in this current this current period so I think it was it was a very interesting dialogue actually um and quite fun but yes it's um we we have we have people who think that the 
the patient attitudes to data are going to switch because of this, because of the chances we've seen, and that governments are going to continue to invest more. And we have people that think that we're just going to see cost containment and not really progressive solutions. So we wait and see. Okay. And your side, Paul, uh, optimist or skepticist, <laughs> may I ask? <laughs> Sorry, maybe uh, one, uh, I was not on, on the microphone. So I wanted to ask, and you're, were you more on the optimist side or on the skeptical side? I'm more on the optimist side because I think there's some really difficult decisions to make. And I think when you have to rush in healthcare, you want to think about how can you do it the most effective way that you can. Um, and I think that thinking about still delivering treatments and and the digital side I think actually gives an opportunity to be able to deliver better care to patients within um, a contained cost envelope so I think we will see more innovation as we've seen over the last couple of months I'm on the more optimistic side but I am um, I have I have counterpoints very good so let's ask the startup group the the business model group uh, Michelle uh, what has been your learnings from that group? Is Michel here? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah, it was a very interesting group. Um, and thank you, Douglas, for the for to moderate and, and giving me the um, the questions. Um, so first, we just outlined a little bit um, uh, uh, one of our examples where, from our portfolio where we implemented um, our our system. Um, we showed how we extract data and work with it. Um, the, the other thing is that that came up uh, was was uh, if you can apply that in uh, this system also in clinical trials, which at the moment we we do not do. Um, and it has mainly regulatory and also resource uh, uh, limitations here on our side. The other thing is uh, we had a discussion about uh, price negotiation. So how does this process work? Um, how can you get a nice price uh, uh, for your for your product? Here we, we can only help with, with, with models, but not with, with, with real answers. Uh, we have uh, partners uh, to help you there. And then ultimately, ultimately, I think that was a very nice aspect. Uh, we talked about uh, the engagement of the patient. In the end, it's about the patient and how can you loop uh, the patient into the, uh, the process. Um, so several uh, people are asking that. And, we hope, so at the moment, at the beginning, that's always one of the topics when you start negotiation. We, you want to have a clinical outcome and you combine it with, with, a, with, a, with a patient reported outcome, uh, being it on the quality standard or whatever. Um, and we are ready, we're ready to, to develop a mobile application for that um, so, so we can capture also the, the view and feeling of the patient. However, at the moment, that has not happened. And here, I can only conclude and, and invite everybody. Uh, uh, be part of this process. Um, um, at the moment, it's happening, and you can shape it. And, and hope we can include uh, more the, the patient. Um, um, I think that's that's good for everybody. If we have all the, the different views and voices, um, uh, so don't wait. Um, uh, do it. Thank you, Michel. So may I ask now, uh, Michael, from his side, what the, have we learned in the group where I was uh, also moderating? I think we had a nice discussion, Michael, or. Christoph, whoever wants to uh, uh, step in here. I'd like to ask Christopher and Patricia to tango now. I think Patricia had to leave, so Christoph, okay. please. <laughs> Christoph seems not to be here anymore. I'm still here. He's on mute. Ah. Patricia, sorry. Patricia, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> we, we won't leave you hanging. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Christopher, do you maybe want to jump in with uh with your thoughts and I'm happy to add in. Yeah, yeah. So so I think we talked we talked about um the the the, the difficulty of actually um measurement and the actual challenges about um um while you can look at um measures in one culture, one context, one language, one country, it will ch suddenly change quite significantly when you move that context. Um, that's just from a data point of view, so that's a challenge. So you might build an algorithm to understand what the value is in one country, but you'll have to really modify that for another country, for example. Um, we also talked about the, 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 the reality of the fact that we can provide measures, lots of different types of measures, but it'll mean validating different types of endpoints. and. Um, and then I think um, we covered the, the fact that you can mash up 
different types of data. So you can bring these patient reported outcomes, but maybe also social media information to get a lay of the land and combine that with medical information as well. Um, so that was sort of the data landscape um, um, we talked about. And so there are a lot of challenges. While, while the future looks bright, it's not that easy. And I think we all agreed on that. Um, and then the other side of the equation, I think, which Patricia would probably be, be better informed to talk about is was the, the incentivization and the and, and what, you, you know, how, how who's going to pay for it and how is that going to work? I'll leave that to you, Patricia, perhaps. Yeah, no, I think we, we spent a lot of time because we're talking about introducing a lot of new ways um, to be more precise and earlier in, in deciding what kinds of interventions are the right are right for someone. And ultimately the goal is that those, that ability to be more precise will allow you to save a lot of money in the system. However, you know, we haven't necessarily seen that work. And I think fundamentally it goes back to the data challenge and also the fact that we don't necessarily have a clear understanding of the underlying costs of the system and also that various systems aren't incentivized to do so. So if we're trying to get a patient to spend much more of their time in wellness, but that requires upfront investment, and let's say that patient is in a private health insurance system where they're moving around, the benefits of that private health insurance of paying those upfront costs for somebody that's going to, let's say, take those benefits to another um, payer, may not, that may not be the right incentive for them. So I think there's a lot of underlying incentives that could act as enablers or barriers um, to the uptake here. Yeah. And actually, one, one last thing that came to mind while you were talking there was the there is a changing um, uh, legislative uh, and regulatory landscape, which actually would say that a lot of these interventions, these algorithmic interventions would be classed as a software as a medical device. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you to all speakers uh, for joining us and sharing your insights. Now I would like to call again uh, for Barry. Um, to maybe give us the final words or what she learned, what was, uh, what was her impression? Please, Barry, are you here? I am here. Um, I wrote some notes, so I'm not sure if it's the final answer. <laughs> I guess what I heard and, and what I think we discussed, and particularly in this readout here, I heard that there's really four things that, that jumped out for me. One is you need commitment, and you need commitment, broad scale, um, across the ecosystem, the stakeholders have got to be aligned for this to work. The second is you need to be able to scale it. There's been a lot of pilots. There's been a lot of buzz. There's been a lot of stories. There's been a lot of learning. But how do you scale a model? And particularly, how do you scale it in an environment like Europe where every country and even within countries, you have different archetypes? So that, that further creates challenge. The fourth is data. Everything requires data. And the biggest problem we have in Europe is you can't take data across borders. So how do you put a scalable system in place, which has the data that you need, which allows some comparisons and some, um, some systems to bring patient information together when you can't really port the data over the country lines? And then the last bit, which I loved what Florian said um, on this topic, you, you have to talk to the patients. You are not going to get to value-based healthcare if you don't have a dialogue with, with the patients. And if you talk to the patients and you give them the opportunity to actually express their views and, and talk about what they're feeling, you can have a much better dialogue about what that treatment needs to look like and therefore what that value needs to ultimately be based on. And, and I think, you know, as just a final word, we're doing this for patients, about patients, so then we can actually have some proper framing around this rather than always talking about the cost. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Barry. Very interesting, very good points. Uh, I especially like uh, the first one, the commitment, because there is something that day one can do about that. And I would now like, if you allow us some two, three more minutes, because now I would like to ask Doug, Douglas uh, to share uh, what we as a day one uh, practice and initiative, will, how we will carry on with this topic on value-based healthcare. Please, uh, uh, Doug, the screen is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and, and thank you also for that intro, Barry. I, I was uh, busily going commitment. That's exactly what we want. 
Um, and that's what we're trying to build here. Um, I'm going to tell you around, about what we're doing with the day one accelerator for next year around the topic of value-based healthcare. And it's uh, a, an invitation for you to get involved and help to build commitment. So you, you heard today some of the challenges and you heard that we need commitment, scale, data, talking to patients to, to, to try and solve those. And this is what we're trying to do to make that happen. Uh, what we want to do is we see there are challenges, but what we think is that there are opportunities, as we saw today from the different uh, startups, both on the virtual stage and in discussions, that can bring new ways to approach problems. And what we'd like to do is bring together medtech and pharma, insurers and payers, providers and patients, and have them define what are the challenges that they think are important. And first of all, have a discussion together to define challenges and share them, and then define a call that will actually make to startups where they can actually begin to work on these solutions. So collectively, as an ecosystem, can we build commitment, define challenges, and then find startups that can deliver on those. On those. That's the plan. Um, these are the kind of startups that we think can help. Um, it can be connectivity to patients. It can be data infrastructure and tools, payments, new ways of thinking about delivery and, and helping, for example, those providers actually make behavioural changes. There are all kinds of things that we think might be able to help. How we're going to go about doing that and the roadmap to get there is today is the kickoff. And we're going to work in July and August together with the supporters who are interested in working on this challenge. So if you're med tech and pharma, insurer, provider, patient that would like to see how you can help to define these challenges, we'd love to hear from you. We'll make a call to startups in September. Uh, we'll make a selection together with the ecosystem to the day one conference and then make a final selection from that shortlist and invite them to the day one accelerator in 2021, where we'll help again to work with the ecosystem to make sure that those bright ideas and solutions get implemented. So if you're interested as a supporter or a startup, please get in contact with me or join the day one Basel Slack where there will be a value-based healthcare channel soon. I will share that now with the chat and you can use that to join the Slack channel, which is obviously something you should do anyway, um, or contact your favourite day one team member uh, and have a chat about how you can get involved as either a supporter or a startup in, in value-based healthcare. Over to you, Thomas. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Doc, for this introduction. I think I'm really excited to move on with this topic. I think this topic will stick around for the next uh, couple of years. As we have heard, it's very complex. It's, uh, we need a commitment of all partners. It's a multi-collaborative game here. What I personally learned a bit is, and that was actually also some stuff that Michael, of course, uh, presented as I was in his breakout, is actually what intrigued me a little bit is that he said, there's a lot of technology coming towards us in, in artificial intelligence, technology, uh, um, more computational power, more data we have, we gain more insights. And the question is, is the system really ready that this technology can be applied? So... Can we really make best use of this technology? And I think this is a very interesting question. I would like to uh, leave it with this question. Thank you all for joining. Thank you uh, for being part, for working with us, for your questions, for, uh, for discussing with us, for your insights. Really great. Thank you to the speakers uh, uh, for also uh, sharing your insights, your knowledge with us. This really helps uh, from this different perspective. And thank you, Deloitte, for uh, helping us to put up uh, this, this event, this webinar. And uh, we will be back uh, after the summer break with the day one experts, with the next day one experts event. And uh, so stay tuned. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. We will leave the channels open now. So 
if some discussions happen, that's fine. We'll leave the channels open for a couple of minutes, a uh, couple, let's say, next 15 to 30 minutes, however. We can't serve you any beer, but I hope in the na next day one experts event, we will be able to do so. And uh, with this, I leave you to this nice evening. Thank you very much for joining. Goodbye and see you soon again. <laughs>